Chapter Sixteen of the Three Midshipmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Midshipmen by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter Sixteen A Flight for Life. The time passed slowly by while the archer's boat with Murray, Adair, and Dick Needham aboard, and the young African lad, Wassa, lay hid under the bank of the river, waiting for the time when they might sally forth to the rescue of Jack Rogers. Everybody was eager for the moment, for all longed to have him safe among them. Wassa's deep gratitude to Hemming was very remarkable, after a separation of so many years, as was also his recollecting him. Murray felt sure that if anyone could rescue Jack Rogers, Wasser was the person to do it. The day at length passed away, and after the party had taken supper, as soon as Wasser thought it was safe, they issued forth from their leafy bower, and with rapid strokes pulled up the stream towards the fort, which had been the scene of contest. Wasser remarked that none of the blacks would be venturing there at night, and that it would be the best place for the boat to remain at. Murray and Adair only landed. Needham had directions to wait for them till within an hour of daylight, and then, if they did not appear, to conclude that they were taken. He pulled down as hard as he could to inform Mr. Hemming and to bring him up to their assistance. Wasser led the way, Alec and Paddy following close after him. Little would any of their friends have recognised in the two half-naked Blackamoor lads who were wont to walk the deck of Her Majesty's ship Ranger, in all the pride of blue cloth, gold-laced caps and gilt buttons. Now, except a pair of scanty drawers, a shirt fastened round the waist with a piece of rope yarn, and a tattered straw hat, clothes they had none. Their feet were tolerably hard from the custom in which they indulged, in common with most midshipmen, of paddling about without shoes or stockings when washing decks. They were not, however, unarmed, for both of them had a brace of pistols, and their dirks stuck in belts concealed by their shirts. It was curious also to see one of the despised negro race taking the lead, as Wasser did on the present occasion. They landed close to the fort, when, without hesitation, he led the way inland, and then, after a little time, they found that they were going uphill. Up, up they went for a long distance. It seemed a mile or more over a well-beaten path. It was not so dark as it had been. The light was increasing. It was that of the rising moon. They found that they had arrived in front of some palisades. They formed the wall to the negro city. Wasser signified that they must get over it to see their friend, and conducted them to the left along the outside of the palisade. At last they got to a spot where he showed them that they might climb over and whispered that there were no houses near whose inhabitants might discover them. The moon, as I was saying, was rising, so there was no time to be lost in reaching Jack's prison, before the light might render the approach more difficult. Cautiously they crept on under the shadow of the houses. The inhabitants appeared to be asleep. Now and then a dog barked, but they saw no one. At last, at the end of a the street, they came to an open space, in which stood a solitary hut. Wasser pulled up and said, Dare your friend. How Alex and Paddy's hearts longed to get at him. Their impulse was to run across the square and to let him out. But at that moment a sentry appeared from the other side of the hut with a musket on his shoulder. Though they did not fear the musket, they knew he might possibly let it off and alarm the town. So they stood under the dark shade of a wall, deliberating what was to be done. They watched him for some time, and ascertained that, like a clockwork figure, he always made the same round at the same pace. "'We shall have time to get across the square and to seize him before he makes his round,' observed Murray. Adair signified that he thought the same, as did Wasser. "'Then,' added Murray, "'you and I, Paddy, will seize him, while Wasser lets Jack out of the prison, ready to come and help us bind and gag the sentry.' "'Now is our time,' whispered Murray. One, two, three, and away. Down the square they dashed at full speed. 
Paddy leapt like a wild man of the woods on a sudden on the astonished sentry's back and pressed his hand tightly over his mouth, while Murray grasped his musket, putting his hand on the pan to prevent it going off. He need not have taken so much trouble as it had no flint in it. While Wassa climbed up to the top of the hut, where he had ascertained there was a hole. It was his honest countenance Jack saw looking down upon him. Jack little thought all the time how near his friends were, and what essential service they were rendering him. Wasser put down his hand, and Jack catching it, Wasser with a strong tug, enabled him to grasp some of the rafters. Jack very quickly was on the roof, and seeing two negro lads struggling with the sentry, guessing that they were in some way trying to serve him, leapt down to help them. The sentry had very little chance against four stout lads, so soon they had him down and gagged and dragged inside the hut. Now run, run, whispered Wasser, no time to lose. Away they all ran as hard as they could pelt. They reached the palisade and began to scramble over it. Jack had not recognised any of his deliverers, but he was much obliged to the little black fellows for the help they had afforded him. Just then a dog barked, and a man's voice was heard shouting. Then another and another joined in the outcry. There could be no doubt that the town was aroused. The wild hubbub in the negro town increased. The midshipmen and their sable alloy had too much reason to fear that they should be captured. Wasser led the way over the palisade. Jack followed. Alec and Paddy brought up the rear. Jack had not yet discovered his friends, as in consequence of their dread of being discovered, no one had spoken. Jack only thought that some negro lads, for some reason or other, had come to his assistance. Run, run, cried Paddy as they jumped down on the outside of the palisades. There was little necessity for his saying this, though. Who are you? exclaimed Jack, the truth breaking on him. Alec, Terence, they answered. Oh, capital, just what I thought I should have thought you'd have done, if I'd fancied it possible, said Jack. Then let's stop and fight them. No, no, said Vassar. Too many men come to fight. Run on, run on. His advice was evidently the wisest, so run they did, and at a very great rate too. It was clear that by some means or other the sentry had made himself heard. He probably did not describe in the most complimentary of terms the people by whom he had been knocked down, gagged and bound. Some horrible fetish had done it, and that, of course, he believed and asserted. The blacks must have thought that their town was attacked and very quickly tumbled up from their beds. They had not many clothes to don and flew to their arms. Shots were heard in different quarters and the previous stillness of the night was rudely broken by shouting and hallowing of men, barking of dogs and crying of children and the screaming of women to each other to inquire what it was all about. The noise, however, was not a thing to be much dreaded. It showed that the negroes were awake, but it was also pretty evident that they had not yet begun the pursuit. So Jack and his companions thought. Wassa led them back to the chief pathway up the hill. There was no other by which they could reach the boat. They had therefore to pass very close again to the principal gate of the city. There was a great chance of their being seen as they did so. There was no help for it, so on they dashed. Never had any of them ran faster in their lives, for they were running for their lives. Down the hill they went, they heard a shout, some men were rushing out of the gate of the city in pursuit. On, on, man's come, never fear, cried Wasser. I should think not, observed Jack, but he did not slacken his speed. Their pursuers came on at a great rate. They knew the ground and their feet were accustomed to it. Alec and Paddy found theirs hurt horribly. Or well, Jack, having on shoes, could not run as fast as the negroes. It was a long way to the boat. Happily, however, the path wound about a good deal, or probably their pursuers, who had arms, would have fired. That is to say, if the arms had locks and were loaded. Slight points in which negro soldiers are not always very particular. Luckily, they had to go down the hill instead of up it. At length they reached the bottom. Still they had some way to go. The voices of their pursuers grew louder and louder. They fancied they had heard some Spaniards among them, uttering their usual horrid oaths. They knew that those wretches were far more barbarous than their black brethren. With the Negroes they might have had some chance of escape, with the Spanish pirates, none. 
on they went they dared not look round there was a sharp report of a pistol a bullet flew by them another and another followed happily as their pursuers were running they could not take a steady aim still they were getting dreadfully near another enemy was added to the pursuers for the midshipmen heard the baying of a bloodhound there could be no doubt about the sound the brute was still at a distance though probably let loose by some of the spaniards not roused till late to join in the chase murray and adair remembered their pistols and there was a satisfaction to feel that they might possibly shoot him before they were torn to pieces not that the task would prove an easy one though just then appeared before them through the dark foliage a sheet of silvery hue it was the river the sight nerved their limbs afresh they had need of something to encourage them scarcely thirty yards behind them came the savage rabble the fugitives had difficulty to keep ahead of them fierce were the shouts of blacks and spaniards and more savage was the baying of the bloodhound paddy who brought up the rear could scarcely help shrieking out for he felt the brute close at his heels he cared much more for it than he did for the bullets he was certain that in another moment the animal would have hold of his legs when up there started just in front of the fugitives honest dick needham and two seamen well armed with muskets and cutlasses dick springing forward made a cut at the savage brute which almost severed its head from its body and then shouted back back you villains or we'll blow you into the sky and then in another tone he cried out run for the boat young gentlemen we'll cover your retreat no one required to be told this a second time and needham and the seamen facing the crowd of blacks and firing as they retreated kept the enemy completely at bay till the midshipman and wasser had reached the boat they were not long in jumping in after them and shoving off away they pulled shouting with delight at their success and leaving their enraged pursuers swearing and grinning with rage on the shore a miss is as good as a mile cried paddy as he seized one of the oars but they were not altogether out of the fire many of the people collected on the shore had muskets and began blazing away at them several of the shots striking the boat and others coming uncomfortably near this only made them pull the faster however while some of the slave dealers people were firing others ran along the bank and launching several canoes paddled off in pursuit this was much worse than their shooting the british boat a light gig pulled well but the canoes would probably paddle faster nothing daunted however jack and murray set to work to reload all the muskets and pistols to make as good a fight of it as they could should they be overtaken they could count the canoes as they appeared darting out from among the bushes on the banks one two three four five six came out one after the other it was a long way down to the spot where hamming said he would await their return before they could reach it the blacks must have overtaken them unless jack and murray could manage to pick off some of their chief men and so perhaps frighten them back both said that they would do their best to effect that object however wasser sat quiet he could do no more for the present not all men even could sit quiet the canoes drew nearer and nearer however a sailor feels very differently on the water and on the shore for even when compelled to run away on his own element he can face his enemy and show fight this murray and rogers did to some effect the canoes had got well within range of their muskets the sooner therefore they began to fire the better chance they would have of stopping their pursuers old brown bess however was never celebrated for carrying very straight and neither jack nor alec did much execution at the same time now and then they saw the negroes bob their heads as the bullets whistled unpleasantly near them some of the people in the canoes fired in return but as dick needham observed they might as well have been firing at the moon for all the harm they did the english boat pulled on the canoes following a long reach was before them surely and steadily the canoes were gaining on the boat the greater portion of the distance to the end of the reach was got over and now in another five minutes perhaps less the canoes would be up with her while there is life there is hope so thought jack and his companions and so they continued making every effort to escape the voices of the negroes chattering away in the headmost canoe sounded very loud 
Jack and Murray had ceased firing, for the best of reasons. They had come to the end of their ammunition. Perhaps it was fortunate they could have done no good, and would only the more have enraged the negroes. The latter also had not fired for some time, probably on the same account. I feel somewhat inclined to squeak as a hare does when a greyhound catches hold of her, but I won't, said Jack, as the headmost canoe got almost up to them. You two in the bows, Johnson and Jones, keep pulling, while all the rest lay about them to drive off the blacks. We're not going to be beat by a parcel of pirates and niggers. The men cheered at Jack's address, and grasping their cutlasses, stood ready to obey his directions. Now came the tug of war. The other canoes got up and crowded round them, but again the undaunted seamen cheered, and firing their pistols right and left among the pirates, laid about them most lustily with their well-sharpened cutlasses. As they cheered, what was their surprise to hear their cheers answered? At the same moment, five dark objects on the water were seen coming round the next point. Murray exclaimed they were men of war boats. They must have made out that their presence was much needed. On they dashed towards the canoes. The pirates saw them coming and dared not stand their onslaught. Before they turned to fly, they made a desperate attempt to capsize the boat and to carry off some of the English as prisoners. They very nearly got hold of Paddy, whom, in spite of his costume and colour, they had discovered not to be a negro. But Jack and Alec hauled him back with the loss of only part of his shirt. Poor Wasser was in the same manner saved by Needham. Had they got him, they would, to a certainty, have killed him. The other boats, now dashing on, put them to flight, and off they went at a great rate up the stream. Hemming himself had come to their rescue. He had felt some misgivings about them, and had returned, intending, if he did not meet them, to land and threaten and ravage the Black King's whole territory with fire and sword if they were not given up. Jack was received with warm congratulation by his friends, but there was not much time for compliments, as Hemming instantly went off in pursuit of the canoes. The canoes paddled fast, but the men of war boats pulled just then faster, and the Negroes and their Spanish allies, finding escape problematical, ran the canoes in on the bank and, leaping on shore, left them to their fate as they were undoubtedly employed to assist directly or indirectly the nefarious slave trade, Hemming set fire to them all, with the exception of one, which he carried off as a trophy. As it was important to get on board as soon as possible, Hemming pulled at once back to the place where the rest of the boats with the prisoners and liberated slaves had been left. They were all safe, and by noon the next day the expedition returned once more to the ship. Sad indeed was the loss they had to report so many fine fellows cut down in a nameless fight with a band of rascally pirates. The captives not only exonerated Hemming of all blame, but assured him that they believed he had done all that a man could do under the circumstances of the case. Everybody on board both ships welcomed Jack, and poor Wasser was highly delighted with the way he was received and praised for the assistance he had afforded in rescuing him from the slave dealers. Nor did Murray and Adair fail to get their meed of applause. I'm not obliged to tell you for all what you have to say, answered Paddy, laughing. Well, I wish some of you would tell me how to wash a black and more white. I have heard that it was a difficult operation. The burnt cork would have come off by itself. But Dick Needham rubbed in the oil and grease so hard that soap and water won't do it. Dr. McCann, when applied to, looked rather grave, and after he had heard the circumstances of the case, delivered a long lecture to prove that black powder rubbed in that way in such a climate when the pores were open would take root and become eradicable terence saw a twinkle in the doctor's eye which made him suspect a quiz and the laughter of jack alec and some of his mother messmates who stood round confirmed the suspicion at first he felt that he ought to be very indignant but his good humour seldom kept away many seconds together and he quickly joined in the laugh against himself. He then accompanied Alec to the hospital, where in a tub with some hot water and soap and some alkali the doctor gave them, they very soon got washed white and returned on deck as spruce-looking midshipmen as they usually appeared. Theirs and Jack's great regret was that Alec had to go back to the brig and they must join the frigate. They would again be separated. 
Rogers and Adair were once more on board the Ranger, with Lieutenant Hemming and Needham, and the rest of the people who had escaped the various dangers to which they had been exposed since they quitted her. Captain Lascelles was of the opinion that it would be necessary to inflict a severe punishment on the slave-dealing king and his white allies, and accordingly resolved to send another expedition up the river without delay, to burn his town and any other barracoons which might be in the neighbourhood or induce him to break off all intercourse with the Spanish slave-dealers. The Commodore was able to carry out his object even sooner than he expected, by the arrival of two other brigs, the Rambler and the Tatler. Jack and Terence were very much disappointed when they found out they were not to go. To their earnest request to be allowed to volunteer, Captain Lascelles replied, I admire your spirit, my lads, but as you're not made of iron, and I cannot afford to expend my midshipmen, Others must take their share of the work. You are both of you already as thin as thread papers. Certainly by this time they had become very brown and wiry, and bore but a slight resemblance to the rosy, jolly-looking midshipmen that they were when they left England. Hemming, however, again went in command, and Wasser begged that he might accompany him as interpreter. With somewhat of an envious feeling, the midshipmen saw a considerable flotilla of boats cross the bar and pull up the river. The day passed away, and so did the greater part of the next, and still the boats did not reappear. Captain Lascelles became somewhat anxious. Hour after hour went by. There they come, there they come, was shouted by several who were on the lookout on deck. Not only were all the boats seen, but several large canoes were in their company. In one of the latter, as they drew near, Jack recognised his friend, the Negro King, seated in the stern, and dressed in the same magnificent uniform in which he had appeared in his own palace. He seemed perfectly happy, and was smoking a pipe with true regal dignity. The side was manned to receive him, and with a grand air he stepped on deck, making a profound bow and a wide flourish with his cocked hat. Captain Lascelles on this went forward to meet him, and ordering up some cushions from the cabin, begged him to be seated and continue smoking his pipe, while he ascertained from Hemming the particulars of the expedition. The expedition had proceeded up the greater part of the way towards the fort without meeting anyone, when near it a canoe appeared approaching them. In it were the stout pilot, Jack's friend, and three other blacks rigged out in what they considered full fig. They came, they said, as ambassadors from the king. He wished to inform the English that Don Diego and the rest of the Spanish slave-dealers had gone away over land to the south. He could not tell where, and that, as he wished to be friends with everybody, he hoped that no further harm might be done to his country. Hemming replied that he was very glad to hear this, but that profession was not practice, and that he must have stronger proofs of his sincerity. The pilot said that the king hoped all the English would visit his capital. Hemming answered that half would go and half would stay to look after the boats, whether treachery was intended or not. The idea was, it appeared, abandoned, and Hemming, with thirty of his men well armed, proceeded up the hill to the king's capital. They found it to be a tolerably strong place, and though they may have taken it by storm, not perhaps without difficulty and loss, the king received them very courteously, and seemed to be a really sensible fellow, perfectly alive to his own interests. During a long palaver, Hemming explained to him that if he persisted in carrying out the slave trade, the English would destroy his barracoons and injure and annoy him in every possible way, but that if he abandoned it and refused to have anything to do with the slave dealers, but would engage in commerce, encourage agriculture, and well treat his people, and act like an honest man, they would assist and encourage him in every possible way, that the Queen of England would be friends with him, call him her well-beloved brother, and send him presents of far greater value than any he had got from the Spaniards. So eloquently, indeed, did Hemming put the case before him, that his negro majesty expressed his eagerness to come off to the good queen's big ship and ratify the treaty, which he desired might forthwith be drawn up. Captain Lascelles lost no time in clenching the matter. All sorts of presents were bestowed on the black sovereign, a gun, some crockery, a pair of boots, a tooth comb, a pair of epaulettes, and half a dozen gaily coloured pocket handkerchiefs. The pilot and the other chiefs, coming in for a share of the good things, 
the captain hinting that this was only a forestalment of what they might expect if they behaved well highly pleased with all that had occurred under a salute of eleven guns from the frigate and more than half seas over the negro potentate and his great ministers of the realm and other followers betook themselves to the shore they're as slippery as their own skins observed the commodore we must have a sharp look on them to keep them to their engagements the ranger had captured several slavers and sent them away to sierra leone for adjudication they had driven many more off from the rivers into which they were bound to take their cargoes when being under easy sail about six miles off the coast a large schooner was seen in shore of them though all sail was made in chase as the schooner increased her distance captain lascelles ordered two boats to be manned in order to pursue her to their great delight jack got command of one the cutter with eight men and adair of the other a gig with six many of the other officers being away in prizes their chief object was to come up with her before the setting in of the sea breeze both boats however pulled badly being sodden from having been so constantly in the water besides which they leaked not a little however jack and paddy had learned that perseverance conquers all difficulties hot as usual was the sun another warm day jack cried terence as they pulled away i wonder how much morrow we shall have left in our bones and how much fat outside them when we get home two hours and a half passed before they got up with the chase the gig from pulling best was ahead jack did not grudge his messmate the honour though he liked to be first when he could the schooner with all her sweeps out as the boats neared her put her helm up and tried to run them down opening at the same time a sharp fire of musketry however they were too quick for her pulling on either side each man seized his musket and let fly in return loading again with a great coolness as they passed her they poured in another volley the sweeps being rigged out prevented them from climbing up by the chains never mind cried jack let us try the quarters he pulled up to one quarter a dare to the other and before the slavers knew where they were going the boats had hooked on the seamen led by their two gallant young officers were springing over the low quarters of the schooner a dare however got a severe lick on the shoulder which would have sent him back into the boat had not one of his men given him a shove up while well, jack got an ugly gash on his arm from a cutlass and would have laid his head bare had not dick needham's trusty weapon interposed to save him all the time the slaver's crew were firing away down into the boats one of the cutter's men was shot and fell over a messmate brown attempted to lift him up but he sank down like a piece of lead it's all over with him cried brown springing over the bullocks and resolved to avenge him it was too true he had been shot through the heart a like fate befell one of the gig's crew still with diminished numbers the british fought on but the odds were fearfully against them they had however gained a footing on the slaver's deck and as they had cutlasses and pistols in their hands which they well knew how to use they felt themselves to be on equal terms with six times their number of the sort of mongrel wretches who made up the slaver's crew the latter at the same time seemed in no way daunted and fought on with the greatest desperation hitherto neither jack nor adair had made out who were the officers of the wretches opposed to them for the smoke hung so thickly over the deck crowded as it was with people of every hue and every variety of costume that it was difficult to distinguish one from the other at last jack caught sight of a little man urging on his companions the voice too he had heard before puff of wind cleared away the smoke jack recognized his old enemy don diego the don knew him also ah you have come to be killed sang out the little man with a horrid grin cut him down cut down the little spy my men he was one of those who destroyed our barracoons and deprived us of our property the sea breeze will soon be up to us and we may laugh at the frigate revenge revenge instigated by these shouts from their fierce chief the slaver's crew uttering loud imprecations made a desperate rush against the english and jack in spite of the gallant defence made by those around him found himself brought on his knee to the deck end of chapter 16
Chapter Seventeen of the Three Midshipmen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Three Midshipmen by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter Seventeen. Aboard the Prize. Don Diego and his companions did not know what Englishmen were made of if they thought they were going to win the day without a hard fight for it. Adair, wounded as he was, threw himself before Jack, and aided by Needham and some of his best men, pistoled some of the Spaniards and cut down others, hurrahing so loudly and charging so fiercely that the rest, in spite of the little Don's exhortations, gave way before them. They pushed on until they reached the mainmast, where a resolute stand was made by the slaver's crew. During this time, Jack recovered sufficiently again to join in the conflict. The little Don, seeing how things were going, rallied a number of his people around him, evidently prepared to make a stand to the last, and Jack, from what he had observed of his character, was fully convinced that he would make some desperate attempt to destroy them, even perhaps by blowing up the schooner and all on board. Fortunately, the hatches of the schooner's decks were open to give air to the unfortunate slaves confined below. They all the time were uttering the most fearful shrieks and cries, not knowing what was going to happen. Pressed backwards, several of the pirates' crew tumbled down the hatchways among the negroes, adding to the confusion and dismay below. Others, pressed by Jack, who was fighting his way forward on the starboard side, leapt overboard and to avoid the cold steel of the avenging british found that death from the ravenous sharks to which they had consigned so many of their black fellow creatures although some gave way others kept rallying round the mainmast and so adair had to keep them engaged to prevent them turning and attacking jack in the rear so hotly was he engaged however that he had no time to look about him a loud shout made him turn his eyes for a moment forward and then he saw Jack, who had gained the forecastle, waving his cutlass in triumph. The Spaniards, who had hitherto shown a bold front, on hearing the shout and seeing their chance of victory was gone, threw themselves pell-mell down the hatchways among their companions, who had by this time regained their legs. What was bad, they had also kept possession of their arms, and began to fire upon the English. The seamen could easily have shot them, cowardly scoundrels retreated among the chained slaves believing that their enemies would not dare to fire for fear of wounding the poor blacks also they counted however without their host never was there a cooler fellow than dick needham and getting his musket ready he ran forward and judging where the spaniards had stowed themselves picked out a couple of them from the very middle of the blacks and leaping down cutlass in hand followed by three of his shipmates they very soon made the rest of the wretches cry out for quarter. When Jack and Terence looked round the deck, they found it cleared, not a little to their surprise. What had become of Don Diego? The villain must have gone below and would be blowing us all up, exclaimed Terence, rushing aft. Forward he certainly was not, or Jack would have seen him. They both, pistol in hand, rushed into the cabin, expecting to have a desperate encounter with the fierce little Spaniard. The door gave way before them. Hello, the fellow's not here, cried Jack. And he's concealed somewhere, answered Paddy. It's very unpleasant to feel. At any moment he may be sending us up like rockets into the sky. I wish that we could rout him out before he commits any mischief. Just then they were recalled on deck by the shout of one of their men. They hurried out of the cabin and looking over the quarter, they saw what they would have perceived before had they looked in the right direction. The Don, with six or seven of his followers, had jumped into their own gig and was pulling away with might and main towards the shore. Jack and Terence at first thought of following him in the cutter. Then there was the danger of Spaniards left on boards rising and overpowering the rest of the English. He also would certainly not yield without the most desperate resistance. The Don will say that exchange is no robbery, exclaimed Paddy. We'd better let him go. He's got our gig and we've got his schooner. And a very magnificent craft she is. With four or five hundred slaves on board, we can well spare him the gig. Jack agreed to this, but suggested that if the sea breeze reached them soon, 
they might still catch the don by the ear meantime they set to work to secure the slaver's crew many of the villains had stowed themselves away among the slaves and were endeavouring to let them loose telling them that the english had come to murder them that their only chance of saving their own lives was to rush upon deck and to murder the english instead happily the attempt was discovered before many of the negroes were set at liberty and the slaver's crew were all knocked down and having both hands and feet slashed together were brought on deck and placed in a row under the bullocks jack saw the breeze coming and gave an order to trim sails to take advantage of it so as to go in pursuit of the gig with don diego in her the frigate lay about eight miles off and of course had not yet perceived the escape of the don she being more in the offing would get the sea breeze first jack and terence watched her trimming sails and then her white canvas began to bulge out and on she came gliding proudly towards them not long afterwards they got the breeze the toe of the cutter would have impeded them so they dropped her to be picked up by the frigate and stood after the gig don diego had got a long start but still from the gig pulling heavily as they knew to their cost they did not despair of overtaking her everything was done to increase the schooner's speed as it was important to get hold of one of the most daring slave dealers and slave captains on the coast a man whose head had grown grey in the vile traffic in which he was engaged and who had already spent half a dozen fortunes made by it paddy i believe we shall catch the don after all exclaimed jack who had been watching the gig through a glass and at the same time inspecting the coast beyond i can make out no creek for him to run into if he attempts to beach the boat he will be swamped to a certainty and serve him right too answered terence but hello what's that for as he spoke a shot fired from the frigate came whizzing over their heads another and another followed in rapid succession one of them flew directly between their masts i don't like to heave too or we shall lose our chance of catching the don observed jack but this is getting rather too serious to be looked upon as a joke it was indeed for in another second three or four more shot came crashing through the sails and against the spars of the schooner one of which the foretop gallant yard was shot away we must signalise them and beg them to be easy cried terence but lo i say jack who could have left that abominable flag flying at the peak there sure enough at the peak of the schooner flew the often disgraced flag of spain when we'll all it down and settle that point afterwards said jack suiting the action to the word and hauling down the flag he was but just in time to save the schooner from a tremendous peppering which the frigate now ranging close up astern had prepared for her jack ran up the rigging nearest the frigate pointed ahead to show that he was changing something indeed by that time the gig when looked for must have been seen clearly from the deck of the frigate oh, i'm glad we did not fire into you my lads shouted captain lascelles through his speaking trumpet you've done well very well but why did you not haul down the slaver's flag with so much to do we never saw it sir shouted jack in return there's the slaver's captain we're after him stand as close as you can but don't get on shore though cried the captain ay ay sir answered jack well pleased to follow the orders given the frigate stood on for some distance after the gig but she had to be hove to that the depth of water might be ascertained and this gave the don an advantage of which he did not fail to profit the guns were continually fired at him the gig was too small an object at that distance to enable even the best of marksmen to hit her with any certainty when the frigate hove to the schooner once more passed her nearer and nearer she drew to the shore we must take care not to wreck our well-won prize observed jack to terence and a leaden line having been found he wisely sent a hand into the chains to heave as soon as possible as he had rounded the schooner too well was it that he did so for in a very few minutes more the schooner would have been on the shore it was provoking however to see the wicked old spaniard pulling on triumphantly they watched the gig as long as they could with their glasses she disappeared amid a cloud of foaming surf which seems ever even in the calmest weather to be breaking on that shore the old fellow has escaped us now but we will still have him some time or other depend on that said jack shutting up his glass however we have destroyed his barracoons and now we've captured his schooner that's one consolation 
he can't love us though truly indeed did don diego nourish a bitter desire to revenge against the british generally and the officers and crew of the ranger especially which he was one day destined to have an opportunity of gratifying to the full the frigate's studding sails being rigged in she with her prize in company shaped a course for sierra leone both jack and terence had been so severely handled when boarding though they did not much feel of their wounds during the excitement of chasing the don that it was necessary for them to return on board the frigate to be under the doctor's hands while another officer was put in charge of the prize this was a great disappointment the captain lascelles promised them that they should have command of the next prize the frigate might take having seen the prize some way on her course the ranger stood back to her cruising ground in the southward in consequence of headwinds and calms she made but slow progress and thus some weeks slowly passed away after events i have described before her people had much work to do this was a great advantage as it enabled jack and terence and the sick and wounded men to recover away from the noxious air of the coast at length it became advisable to communicate with king bon bon whose prisoner jack had been and as both he and terence knew the river they were ordered to proceed up it to deliver the message and to return as soon as possible i ought to have said that wasser had attached himself to his old friend hemming and had entered regularly as a seaman on board the frigate a very steady and careful lad he was too he now went with the expedition to act as interpreter the boat crossed the bar safely several traders were in the river exchanging manchester goods and cutlery for palm oil ivory gold dust and other articles of value king bonbon received the midshipmen most politely and then gave them a handsome feast though as paddy remarked the cookery was rather dubious he then frankly assured them that he was growing far richer as an honest trader keeping a monopoly of the chief articles himself by the by than he had with all his connections with the slave dealers taking into account the occasional burning of his barracoons and the hot water in which he was continually kept of course king bonbon was a sensible fellow and saw things in their true light what we have heard from our regal friend fully reconciles me to all the hard work we have to go through on this coast observed jack as he and terence were talking the matter over on their return down river one thing is clear this abominable slave trade must be put down and i believe that we are setting the right way to work to do it first make it unprofitable and very dangerous and then show the natives the advantage of civilization and commerce when the boat reached the mouth of the river the frigate was nowhere to be seen then paddy exclaimed jack clutching his rifle let us have a cruise on our own hook remember the prize you took among the ionian fell fellow how merrily they laughed at the recollection of that early freak of theirs paddy of course was delighted to join in any scheme of jack's they could not tell in which direction the frigate had gone they had a hazard steered to the southward they had a good supply of provisions in the boat king bon bon had given them still more all that day they looked out anxiously for a sail but sighted none the greater part of the next passed much in the same manner they were growing impatient it is not pleasant to have sick cramped up in a small boat under a burning sun off the coast of africa with nothing to do at last the sea breeze set in and soon afterwards paddy jumped up and in his delight almost toppled overboard exclaiming a sail a sail as the stranger approached jack made her out to be a long low black brig he ordered the boat's sail to be lowered and the people to lie down in the bottom of the boat and cover themselves up with the sail they both thought that the approaching brig was a slaver but to make more sure they called wasser to him he crept along under the sail and put his eyes up over the gunwale yes big slaver no doubt he observed but no get slavey in yet then we'll follow and board her cried jack and if she won't heave to we'll make her this seemed rather a vaunting boast for two midshipmen and six men and a small boat to make but jack was perfectly in earnest about the matter the men had their oars all ready to ship at a moment's notice the brig stood on till she was with about four hundred yards of the boat and jack who was watching her from under the sail thought that he should have to get out of her way to prevent being run down suddenly she changed her course and hauled more off land perhaps her people suspected a ruse in an instant as jack gave the order 
up sprang his men out went their oars and away after the brig they pulled the character of the brig was soon shown for no sooner did her crew see that they were pursued than they began peppering away at the gig while a gun was run out at a port on her quarter which opened a fire of round and grape shot her low bullocks afforded no protection to the crew working the gun so jack stood up and taking deliberate aim shot one of them just as he was about to fire terence give me your rifle and reload mine he exclaimed terence did as he was bid another of the gunner's crew fell a third and fourth shared the same fate the slaver's people could not understand how this had happened but terror seized them and they refused to go to the gun this however did not save them for the unerring rifle picked out several on different parts of the deck the breeze was freshening and the slaver made all sail away from the boat but as a thresher pertinaciously pursues a whale till it has destroyed it so did the little gig follow the large brig which looked large enough to destroy a hundred such pygmy cockle shells jack felt that everything depended on his coolness and the steadiness of his aim aided by terence well he did so his work the astonished crew of the slaver must have fancied that they were pursued by evil spirits rather than by men once more they kept away dead before the wind and crossing the bows of the boat stood towards the coast it became evident that their intention was to run the vessel on shore and abandon her jack and terence had no fancy that they should do that they did not wish to lose their prize the breeze however increased so much that they could hardly keep away with her still they followed firing as rapidly as before at last jack found that his shots were no longer telling and he was afraid of expending all his ammunition he ceased firing but still followed hard after the slaver a sandy little bay was ahead sheltered somewhat by a reef of rocks on the roll of the atlantic towards it the slaver was steered she grounded in smooth water boat was lowered and into it some of her crew tumbled while others appeared to be swimming on shore by the time they got up to the brig's quarter and climbed on board all the crew had escaped with the exception of two men one of whom was dying the other was dead oh terence exclaimed jack as he looked at it. this is very dreadful what asked adair surprised that my hand should have done that answered jack gravely to know that one has been killing people is bad enough to see them afterwards oh i wish i hadn't done it well then you see jack the slaver would have got off taken three or four hundred or more poor black people away from their homes and families a third of whom would have probably died miserably on board and the rest would have to be destined to spend their lives in abject slavery and to become the parents of a race of slaves those spaniards or portuguese or whatever they are have brought about their own deaths every shot you fired contributed to prevent a vast amount of wretchedness and suffering leaving the wounded man to wasser's care they went below to examine their prize they found that she was fully equipped for carrying seven or eight hundred slaves instead of only three hundred or four hundred as terence had supposed she had two brass guns an ample supply of arms and ammunition of every sort so that she was as well able to act the pirate as the slaver they could not decide what to do with her they feared that if they left her that her crew would return and burn her while at the same time they were anxious to get back to the frigate after waiting some time their course was decided by seeing the ranger in the offing terence said jack you must go off to her leave me and the rifles with dick needham to load them and if the pirates appear i will keep them at bay till you return in vain terence expostulated jack would have it so and he was compelled to obey thus were jack and sturdy dick needham left alone on board the stranded vessel they watched the gig as she pulled away till she was lost in the distance now needham said jack if the pirates come back which is more than likely we must be prepared to give them a warm reception see you load the rifles and i'll fire em jack very quickly got over his scruples about killing his enemies ay ay sir answered dick not at first quite comprehending what a warm reception meant but sir as they've left plenty of ammunition on board and these two brass guns besides no end of muskets we might give them a warmer still if you think it fit sir we'll load the guns with langage and range the muskets along the deck 
and at any spare moment we are using the rifles i might be popping them off jack highly approved of dick's notion and only wished that the slaver's crew would come back that he might carry it into execution they both had been so busy that they had not thought of the poor wretched spaniard suddenly jack recollected him he had been placed in the shade under the poop deck he was still breathing immortal decide i die of thirst i die of thirst groaned the miserable man showing his glazed eyes his parched lips showed how much he was suffering dick bring some water for this poor fellow cried rogers oh senor you are very kind i am a wretch i know but as i hope to be forgiven i forgive the man who shot me they were very nearly the last words the spaniard uttered a cry from needham called jack out on deck there appeared on the beach the whole crew of the slaver in addition some twenty or thirty others white men and negroes they evidently did not perceive that anybody was on board and began deliberately to launch a boat by which they had reached the shore and which terence had neglected to tow off before he left the brig jack waited until they had shoved off now dick said he creeping to one of the ports stand by to load and hand me the rifles while i do my duty he was going to say pick them off shot succeeded shot and three men were hit before the pirates knew where their enemies were concealed the boat was seen to put back the people in her leaping in a desperate hurry on shore it won't do to let them fancy they are safe yet cried jack hand me another rifle he continued firing away seldom failing to hit the man he aimed at hurrah hurrah shouted needham they're running off they are running off so they were but they had not gone far before a man was seen galloping up on horseback jack thought he looked remarkably like don diego he began striking right and left with a sword at the fugitives and was evidently urging them to make an attempt to regain the brig at last he succeeded in inducing another party to embark but he himself remained on shore several times jack had aimed at him but he seemed to bear a charmed life none of the bullets took effect jack was afraid of firing at him again for his rifle ammunition was almost expended finding the firing cease the pirates gained courage and pulled boldly towards the brig now's the time for our dose of langarage sir cried needham jack nodded his consent dick ran out one of the guns jack pointed it and fired they sprang to the other and fired that shrieks and cries followed and the boat in a sinking condition put back to the shore don diego got off his horse and stamped with rage he could not make it out but the men would not make another attempt in a minute more they had all disappeared as soon as they were clear off jack and needham set to work to examine the vessel more minutely in the hopes of discovering some small quantity of water or other liquid which they could drink vain again was their search but on opening a locker jack observed a box thickly bound with brass he tried to pull it out but could not move it alone so he summoned needham to his assistance it was very heavy we'll see what's in it said jack perhaps had he reflected he might have waited to deliver it over unopened to captain lascelles however this did not occur to him at the moment the cold chisel and the hammer were soon found and on the chest being forced open rolls of glittering gold coin lay exposed to view here's a mint of gold cried needham i wonder them pirate chaps didn't try to walk off with it shows what a fright they must have been in to leave it behind if they knew it was here answered jack however we must shut the box up again it is lawful prize money and will be divided in due proportions among all hands that's one comfort by the by needham said jack after the box had been closed it strikes me that old don diego must have known that the gold is on board and that makes him so anxious to get hold of the vessel to recover it oh, how thirsty i am for my part just now i'd rather have a quart of water than that box of gold so would i sir answered needham maybe though we shall find it cooler on deck where there's a breath of air fortunately jack took needham's hint on looking towards the land the whole beach was covered with men carrying among them six or eight large canoes while the little don appeared as before on horseback directing their movements jack knowing the incentive which was influencing his enemies and seeing that the preparations to attack the brig might well have despaired of successfully resisting them 
in needham were not people to sell their lives cheaply as before they loaded the brass guns and all the muskets and rifles he waited however to fire till the canoes were launched then he immediately opened up them the canoes came on don diego was in one of them he was eager probably to secure his gold jack took a steady aim at him down he sank to the bottom of the canoe still that canoe came on and jack fancied he could see the old man's arm lifted up still pointing at the brig he could not bring himself to fire at him again as he thus lay wounded and almost helpless needham however had marked the canoe and pointing his gun at her let fly a whole shower of lagrange about the heads of the negroes paddling in her many were knocked over and the remainder turning her round made the best of their way back to the beach the other canoes stopped and wavered jack plied them well with bullets the people on shore seemed to be beckoning them back jack the thought of him taking a glance seaward to ascertain if assistance was at hand and there he saw the ranger under full sail standing towards him his danger was not over yet the pirates made another desperate attempt to regain the brig but were as gallantly repulsed as before the negroes not being able to withstand the hot fire kept up on them jack and needham set up as loud a cheer as their parched throats would let them give when in a short time they saw hemming in a boat and adair and another approaching the brig fortunately she had taken the ground so softly that she was hove off that very evening adair however in consequence of the exertions he had gone through was too ill to accompany rogers in charge of her to sierra leone so jack much to his regret had to go by himself not forgetting his faithful rifle meanwhile the ranger stood to the southward adair had got almost well he was on the lookout aloft when his eye fell on a dark object floating on the water first he thought it might be a rock then a dead whale at length he felt convinced it was a vessel either capsized or with all her canvas lowered he descended below and reported the circumstance to captain lascelles the ship was steered towards the object and his last conjecture was found to be the right one as they got close to the vessel a small schooner one person only was seen walking the deck that's a midshipman sir said adair to mr hemming i can't quite make him out but he looks very like alec murray the frigate was hove to a boat was lowered in which adair went and sure enough alec murray was the person seen he looked ill and thin my dear fellow how do you come to be in this plight asked terence as he jumped on board the little craft it's a long story said murray he took her off to the southward off benguela and captain grant put me in charge of her to carry her to sierra leone she had the fever on board i have no doubt at first it broke out the other day after we parted company with the archer and one after the other of my poor fellows died a black man and a boy whom we took in the prize are the only survivors and they are still below sick with the disease I have been waiting in hopes that they are getting well and strong enough to make sail proceed on my voyage i'll give you a fuller history another time the best thing you can do is to let the little craft go her own way and come board us observed adair what paddy would you counsel such a course exclaimed murray captain grant put me in charge of the vessel to carry her to sierra leone and while i've a life for me that's what i'm bound to do then old fellow i'll go with you if captain lascelles will let me answered terence warmly that's settled i'll go on board get leave and bring dr mccann to have a look at your people and to leave some physic for them to take away went terence he had a hard battle to fight with his captain who however expressed his admiration of the spirit evinced by murray needham and wasser and another man and a boy were directed to go on board to act as crew dr mccann came on board the schooner and having prescribed for murray and his two negroes and pronounced them in a fair way of recovery took his departure murray then made sail and shaped a course for sierra leone much happier than he'd been for a long time End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the three midshipmen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording done by jules harlock of mississauga ontario canada the three midshipmen by william henry giles kingston chapter eighteen an adventurous voyage who would not rather command a gunboat or even a dispatch vessel or fire ship than be the junior lieutenant mate or midshipman on board a line of battleship or the smartest frigate afloat such were murray's feelings as he and adair paced the deck of the somewhat unseaworthy little schooner of which he had been placed in charge by captain grant while he stood away towards sierra leone the ranger continued her course to the southward i can't say much for your accommodations observed terence after they had stood watching the fast receding frigate and murray had shown him over his craft i won't boast of it and if i had to fit out a yacht i should choose something better answered murray laughing the whole cabin was only eight feet long and though it was five high in the centre under a raised skylight it was scarcely more than three at the sides which being right aft it decreased rapidly as the stern narrowed there was a forepeak in which the two poor negroes lay but there was no room in it for more people so that the rest of the crew were obliged to live in the after cabin adair certainly did not know the discomforts to which he was subjecting himself when he undertook to accompany murray not a particle of furniture was there in the cabin the beams and sides were begrimed with dirt and cockroaches and a considerable variety of other entomological specimens crawled in and out of every crevice in the planks and found their way among all the provisions as well as into every mess of food cooked on board the schooner was laden with tobacco and monkey skins which latter she had taken on board at one of the ports in exchange for some of her tobacco the remainder which she was about to barter for slaves negro head for negroes as paddy remarked when murray gave him the account several days of the voyage had passed with light winds and smooth sea and not unpleasantly though but little progress had been made when as adair who had first watch at night was walking the deck thinking that all was right he heard a roaring noise on the port quarter he looked astern a long white line of curling foam came rolling up at a rapid rate towards them lower the peak slack away the main halyards in with the mainsail brail up the foresail murray murray on deck here all hands on deck in with the jib and down with the forestay sail the sudden quick jerking of the little vessel would soon have awakened all the watch below had his voice not done so the sails were not lowered a moment too soon on flew the schooner under bare poles the sea roaring up on either side and often breaking over her every man had to hold on for his life away away she flew every instant plunging more and more while the foaming seas seemed still more eager to make her their prey murray attended by wasser disappeared below he soon returned patty he said touching adair on the shoulder i've bad news we've sprung a leak and i fear that the vessel is sinking both murray and adair had gone through so many dangers that neither of them were inclined to despair even when they found themselves on board a, a little rotten vessel plunging along through terrific seas with a leak in her bottom which was letting in the water at a rate which must speedily send her far down to the depths of the old ocean 
away flew the little craft under bare poles the dark seas with thick crests of white rolling up on either side of them with loud roars and threatening to come right down upon the deck and swamp them tumbling about as the vessel was it was no easy matter even to get the pump rigged in the dark that task however was at length accomplished and all hands set to with a will in the hopes of clearing the vessel of water at first it seemed to be rushing in as fast as it gushed out i believe after all it was only the water which got down the hatches when the sea first broke aboard of us said murray and with this idea both he and terence were much comforted drearily and wearily drew on the dark hours of that tempestuous night daylight came at last and only exhibited the scene of wild commotion around the leaden sky the dark gray waves broken into strange shapes leaping and rolling over each other and covered with masses of white foam off that strange african coast storms and calms succeed each other with but scant warning by seven o'clock the wind suddenly dropped and in another hour the sea went down and the lately wave-tossed bark lay perfectly becalmed terence said murray look over the side of the vessel doesn't she strike you as being much lower in the water than she was terence feared so the well was sounded and three feet of water was found in the hold man the pump cried murray this was done but before many minutes had passed the pump broke the damage was considerable but needham was a handy fellow and could manage nearly any work the two young officers lent him a hand all sorts of devices were thought of all sorts of things were substituted for those which were wanting but with the quantity of water in the hold and in the way the craft was tumbled about by the swell the operation took much longer time than might be supposed it is very exciting to read of a ship sinking with the pumps out of order and half a dozen leaks in her bottom but the reality though it may also be exciting is very far from pleasant people under such circumstances are inclined to labor away rather in a hurry and not to stand on much ceremony as to what they do night was coming on rapidly they labored and labored away it was difficult enough to do it with daylight it was a question whether they could make any progress at all in the dark there sir exclaimed needham giving a hearty blow with his hammer and relieving his pent-up feelings by a loud outletting of his breath between a groan and a sigh i hope that will do without stopping a moment he and wasser with white the other seamen seized the brake and began laboring away with all their might to the great joy of all hands a clear full stream came gushing upon deck and ran out through the scuppers the blacks and all not immediately engaged in mending the pump had been bailing away all the time with buckets they pumped and pumped away and after half an hour's toil they found on sounding that they had much lessened the water in the hold Huzza! shouted needham we'll do now never fear lads nearly three hours however passed before the vessel was completely cleared of water it was adair's watch i shall sleep more soundly than i have done for many a day said murray as he prepared to turn into his horrible little berth we have been so mercifully preserved that i trust the same almighty hand will protect us to the end of our voyage paddy my dear fellow do you ever pray i never see you on your knees pray answered adair with some hesitation of course i do that is to say sometimes when i recollect it i dare say i ought more than i do 
murray took his shipmates arms as they stood together near the taffrail of their little craft looking out over that heaving ocean whose smooth glass-like undulations reflected ever and anon the bright stars which glittered in the dark sky above their heads tell me who but one whose hand is powerful to save could have preserved us from the numberless dangers into which our duty but how often our thoughtlessness has led us were it not by his mercy we should even now be sinking beneath those glassy but treacherous swells on which our vessel floats securely then should we not my dear adair pray to him not only now and then when we may think of it but at morning and evening when we rise and when we sleep and oftentimes during the course of the day remember what the bible says it tells us to pray always you are right murray you are always right answered adair with a sigh i know too that you practice what you preach or i would not listen to you i'll try to follow your advice i'll pray when i turn in by and by i'll thank god that we have not gone to the bottom and i'll pray that we may be saved as we have been all along in the dangers we may have to encounter why not pray at once exclaimed murray all on board here have been equally preserved the same god made us all the same god will hear our prayers yes yes all right i'll do what you like said adair the young midshipman called the crew around them after needham took the helm they and wasser and the other seamen knelt on the deck and though in no set phrases offered up their hearty thanks for their preservation from the dangers which had threatened them and earnestly did they pray that they might be carried in safety through those they might yet have to encounter murray was one of those people who could think well and when he wrote had no difficulty in expressing himself yet when he came to speak aloud and more particularly to pray aloud found that the exact words he might have wished to use were not forthcoming the two poor blacks who perhaps had never in their lives seen white men praying before stood by astonished at what was taking place they asked wasser what it was all about he was rather more enlightened than they were he told them to the best of his knowledge they listened attentively they said that they should like to know more about the matter and he promised them that he would ask mr murray to speak to them on the subject thus was a way opened into the hearts of these two benighted sons of africa to receive the good seed of the truth by this unpremeditated act of the young midshipman how many other midshipmen might do the same with the most blessed results if they themselves did but feel the importance of performing boldly and fearlessly their duty as christians with the return of daylight the weather promised to be fair and making sail they again shaped their course for sierra leone as may be supposed even in calm weather they had no very great amount of enjoyment when the sun shone they were almost roasted by its burning rays and when it was obscured they were pretty well parboiled do all they could also they could not keep the cabin clear of cockroaches and numberless other creeping things a meal was anything but an easy or pleasant operation the only chance of not having half a dozen live creatures sticking to each mouthful was to keep not only the dishes but the plates covered up disagreeable as it was murray and adair could not help laughing at each other as at every mouthful they had to pop in their forks under the covers which were instantly clamped down again and what was brought out thoroughly examined before it was committed to the mouth while as adair remarked the soup was more properly beetle broth than anything else 
the schooner rejoiced in the name of the venus though as the midshipmen agreed she was the very ugliest venus they had ever seen she had besides tobacco a quantity of monkey skins on board they were sitting at dinner one day for the sun was too hot to keep on deck and they had no awning i say murray is there not a somewhat disagreeable odour coming from out f from forward observed adair sniffing about tobaccoish i find it rather answered murray laughing i have perceived it for some days it is enough to cure the most determined smoker of his love for the precious weed it is from the tobacco we have on board after being thoroughly wetted it is now taken to heating however we may hope for the best at present it is bearable a bright idea struck them soon after this they might turn the monkey skins to advantage they had needles and a good supply of twine so that they set to work and neatly sewed them together till they had manufactured an awning sufficiently large to cover a good part of the deck they could now take their meals and sleep occasionally when the weather was fair in fresh air which was a great luxury at length wasser who had the lookout one morning shouted land 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 on the starboard bow everybody in a moment jumped up after examination wasser declared his conviction that it was somewhere off the gold coast not far from cape coast castle still murray and adair agreed that it would be far better to stand on because if they could manage to weather cape palmas they might have a quick run to sierra leone the schooner was soon afterwards put about no one complained though they might have cast a wistful eye at the harbour they were leaving astern we are doing what is right depend upon it observed murray if so all will turn up right in the end the provisions had they knew been running short they now carefully examined into their stock when to their dismay they found that they had only a supply remaining for three or four days never mind was murray's remark we will go on half allowance in three or four days at most we shall weather the cape and then we shall have sufficient provisions to keep us alive till we get in no one even thought of complaining of this arrangement but took with thankfulness their half allowance of food murray was much pleased with the way the men bore their privations he never thought about himself and took less than any one i remember hearing an account given by some friends of ours of the behaviour of their servants during a famine in england many years ago observed murray corn was very scarce and bread being consequently at an enormous price they determined to put their household on an allowance and to allow so many slices to each servant in the day giving them rice and other things instead not stinting them therefore in their food this excessively enraged the pampered menials and their old butler who was the most indignant ate so much meat and puddings of all sorts and drank so much beer that he actually brought on a surfeit and died from it how angry most of the fellows at school would have been if i told that they could not have butter or sugar in their tea never mind if the butter was not to be procured and the sugar had by chance not come from the grocers how differently do these poor seamen and the ignorant blacks behave not a grumble is heard not a look even of annoyance is seen day after day they stood on thinking that they must sight camp palmas before many hours had passed and then after making the land they found that they could not be many miles farther to the west than they were before still we might do it if we could but get a stiffish breeze observed murray i think the wind is drawing out more from the northwest and east 
what say you patty let's keep at it to the last moment i'm ready for what you are answered adair the schooner was once more put about with her head to the westward everybody whistled as they walked the deck even the blacks did so though they did not know the reason why the breeze did not come a bit the faster on that account however at night it blew pretty strong off the land and their hopes again revived but as the sun rose it backed once more into the old quarter and once more they had to tack on making the land there were the identical hillocks and clumps of trees they had before seen murray and adair agreed that there must be all the time a strong current setting them to the eastward and this on running in closer heaving to and trying the bottom with the lead they found to be the case provision for two days in less than a half an allowance was all they had now got murray and adair consulted together we shall have to make for the nearest port i fear after all or run the chance of starving said adair there is no alternative answered murray with a sigh we have done our best that we have replied adair quickly there is no doubt about that you have that is to say i should have given up long ago the sooner we shape a course for cape coast castle the better the schooner was kept away to retrace her steps to the eastward but now the wind fell altogether and they began to fear that after all they should get nowhere the little food they had left was very bad gradually it disappeared and at length they literally had nothing eatable on board we must take a reef in our waistbands and suck our thumbs said paddy i see no other remedy for it he said this in the hearing of the men to encourage them as much as he could we cannot be far off cape coast castle that is one comfort added murray we will keep a sharp lookout for it at all events the day passed and so did the next and still the calm continued they searched about in every part of the vessel in the hopes of discovering a store of farina or rice but nothing could they find but the rotting tobacco and the monkey skins and starving as they were they could not manage to eat them even when reduced to this extremity the young officers themselves did not despond nor did their men who looked to them for example do so either murray calculated that if they could get a breeze they might reach the port of which they were steering in less than twenty-four hours it was very tantalizing to be so near it and yet not to be able to get there had they had any fish hooks they would they thought be able to catch some fish but none were to be found nor had they a file with which to manufacture any out of old nails as they had often heard of being done necessity is the mother of invention exclaimed adair suddenly there is a piece of tin i have some scissors in my dressing-case and i think i could manage to cut out a hook or two before they are quite blunted let's try at all events the scissors were produced when to their great delight a file for finger-nails was discovered at the back of the blades not only were two tin hooks cut out but three more were manufactured out of the same nails before the files were rendered completely useless bait was the next thing to be procured as there was nothing eatable on board how was it to be got that was the question adair solved it by trying one of his hooks without any hurrah he exclaimed in less than five minutes i have a bite hurrah up came the curious-looking monster in the shape of a fish it was a question whether or not it was poisonous a fire was made and a pot put on to boil into which the creature part of it being cut off for bait was immediately propped they would rather have caught a young shark with whose character they were acquainted but starving men are not particular 
before the pot had begun to boil a fresh breeze came in from the offing and away flew the little schooner with more liveliness than she had displayed for many a day the lines were hauled in murray and adair agreed not to touch the strange fish they also advised the men not to eat of it the sun went down and all night they ran on at a fair rate the next morning land was in sight they hoped that it might be near their destination adair had just relieved murray who had turned in to go to sleep he observed the black man looking very miserable and presently the black boy complained of being very ill what have you been about sambo asked adair looking into the caboose oh massa massa me eat fish groaned the poor lad it ought to have been thrown overboard to have removed temptation out of your way observed adair taking the pot with the intention of suiting the action to the word but on lifting the lid he found it empty the negroes had eaten up every particle of the fish they groaned and rolled about for some time evidently in some pain and in considerable alarm it was no wonder they were ill but it was evident also that the fish could not have been of a very poisonous character or they would have been much worse indeed they speedily forgot all their sicknesses on hearing wasser exclaim dare dare those hills above cape coast castle the words indeed had a great effect on all on board murray who had been there before the instant he came on deck pronounced wasser to be right and in a short time the schooner was running in towards a collection of conical and wooded heights with the strong and formidable looking fortress of cape coast built on a mass of rock in front of them with the sea washing round a considerable part of it it looked a very large fortification indeed it covered several acres of ground mounts to upward of a hundred guns and is kept in the most efficient condition the old castle stands in about the centre of the fortress and is four stories in height the governor and his suite as do most of the public officers find ample accommodation within its walls it is garrisoned by black soldiers chiefly from the west indies but their officers are all englishmen as soon as the schooner's anchors were let go murray and adair hurried on shore to report themselves to the governor and to obtain his assistance the moment he heard of the state of the schooner's crew he sent off provisions insisting on the midshipmen remaining to dine with him that they might relate their adventures but you young gentlemen are probably hungry and would rather not wait for dinner observed the governor slightly so answered adair seeing that nothing has passed our lips for the last two days we were in a hurry to get food for our people so had no time to eat before calling on your excellency the remark in a very few minutes procured the midshipmen an ample luncheon to which they did full justice and would very likely have done more than justice had not the good-natured governor stopped them and hinted that they would spoil their appetites for dinner no fear of that sir answered adair laughing midshipmen make it a rule always to be ready to eat two dinners if called upon to do so in a way of duty however i dare say we can hold on now till dinner-time murray and adair had no intention of spending the interval in idleness though they would have gladly gone to sleep or taken a bath they again hurried on board their craft to ascertain that the provisions had arrived and that their men were made comfortable needham had done all that they could wish and was very proud of being left in charge of the schooner while they were on shore the first thing to be done was to refit their vessel before she would be in a fit state again to put to sea 
and to effect this they would without delay took the necessary steps to procure rope and other stores on returning to the port the governor received them with the greatest kindness and hospitality and as they sat in the cool dining-room in the castle they agreed that it was a perfect paradise compared with their stuffy little cabin when the noonday sun was striking down on the deck all things are by comparison observed adair sententiously some people now at home would not think this old fort on the african coast much of a paradise several guests merchants and others were present and they had to recount their adventures to all the party on returning on board having moored the vessel in a safe position they turned in and slept as midshipmen thoroughly worn out with anxiety and fatigue with good consciences and a comfortable dinner inside them can sleep the next morning all hands set to work with the will to refit the schooner by heaving her down they got at what they believed to be the chief leak and caulked it and in four days they considered their craft once more ready for sea the governor supplied them with provisions for forty days and very kindly sent them some extra luxuries for themselves by the governor's advice they took one entire day's rest for themselves and their crew then in high spirits and anticipating no further difficulties they once more put to sea they had arms and powder and a six-pounder gun which had belonged to the schooner and as compared to their previous condition they felt themselves in a condition to encounter any gale of wind or any enemies they were likely to meet with when they went to pay their farewell respects to the governor he said that the state of their little vessel had been reported to him and that he would really advise them to give up the attempt to take her to sierra leone and to wait till a man-of-war should call off the castle to receive them on board murray's answer may be supposed though he thanked the governor for his advice the day was remarkably sultry and close there was a haze but not sufficient to obscure altogether the sun's beams while the only wind which blew came off the hot sands in the interior they agreed that they would be better off at sea than roasting on shore and so getting on board they hoved up the anchor and made all sail to the westward patty said murray as they were walking the deck after dinner almost gasping for breath i don't quite like the look of the weather what do you think of it that we should stand by to shorten sail at a moment's notice answered adair see that white line of foam curling away over the glassy surface of the water out there here it comes i see it all hands shorten sail shouted murray as he and adair ran to help execute the order they were but just in time when the tornado came thundering down upon them the main and peak halyards were let go and the mainsail was handed while the topsail and jib sheets were let fly and round spun the vessel almost capsizing as she did so for the foresail was not yet brailed up it was hard work to brail it up fluttering as it was in the gale but at length away she flew before the gale some people have an idea that the climate on the coast of africa is all sunshine and heat hot enough it is but at the same time the sky is often dark lowering and gloomy in the extreme nothing can have a more depressing effect than the atmosphere at such times on all not thoroughly acclimated to it everything was made snug on board but for three entire days they could scarcely show a stitch of sail while the little vessel tumbled about so much that it was with difficulty they could light a fire for a short time in the caboose they got some salt beef boiled and then a sea came in and put the fire out and though they tried hard they could not light it again however the beef was pretty well done and lasted them some days 
Marie and Adair passed the time as they best could. They had but a small supply of books. The cabin was so close and hot, and on the deck the wind blew so hard that it was somewhat difficult undertaking to attempt to read. They did not manage, therefore, to add much to their stock of knowledge during the period of the gale. The vessel, however, happily held together, and at the end of three days the weather gave signs of moderating. "'That's a comfort!' exclaimed Adair, as once more they were able to make sail, and the schooner, with everything she could carry, was put on her proper course. It will be hard if we do not reach Sierra Leone before long now. They, however, on taking an observation, found that they were much farther from their destination than they were when at Cape Coast Castle. At it again they went, however, but the wind fell, and for several days they made but very little progress. Still they were going in the way they wanted, and that was something. For about a week they stood on thus, with the wind not only light, but very scant. One afternoon, Wasser's sharp eye discovered a sail to windward. Murray went aloft with his glass to have a look at her. "'What do you make of her?' asked Adair. "'A brig or a brigantine, a two-masted vessel of some sort,' answered Murray. "'She is standing this way. I do not altogether like her looks.' she has a wide spread of white canvas and so if she is not a man of war she is a slaver of that i have little doubt the crew heard what was said murray remained some time longer aloft when he came down he looked grave and determined my lads he exclaimed after exchanging a few words with adair i have very little doubt that the craft in sight is a slaver or pirate and that at all events she will treat us with scant ceremony we must beat her off i know that you all will do your best to do so that we will sir never fear answered needham in the name of the rest i know that my men there's no time to be lost in getting ready though said murray hand up the arms and we'll try to give the fellows whoever they may be a warm reception if they attempt to molest us all hands were instantly employed in getting ready for the enemy the gun was loaded and several shot placed in a rack near it the muskets and pistols were also loaded and cutlasses were buckled on they had no boarding nettings and their only hope of victory was by showing so bold a front at first that the enemy might be driven off without coming to close quarters as the stranger drew near she was seen to be a most wicked rakish-looking brigantine and neither murray nor adair had any longer the slightest doubt in their minds that she was a slaver they hoisted the english ensign but she showed no colours in return we shall have to fight for it observed murray to adair but though the odds are fearfully against us i have a strange feeling of satisfaction in contemplating such a contest i cannot help trusting that we shall come off victorious in spite of the apparent strength of our enemy i am sure i hope so said adair who did not quite understand the thoughts which were pressing through his messmate's head we will fight away as long as we have hands to fight with and an ounce of gunpowder for our muskets it was a craft like that brigandine out there captured poor hanbury and murdered him and his boat crew i only wish that we had a few more guns and men and if that is the very pirate we may avenge his death no no do not talk of vengeance adair said murray gravely vengeance does not belong to man it would be our duty if we had the power to take the miscreants and to bring them to justice as it is i trust that though with infinitely inferior force we may beat them off 
but we must not as christians allow ourselves for a moment to indulge in the idea that we are avenging the death or the wrongs of even the dearest of our relations or friends i had not seen the matter in that light answered adair then my dear fellow try and do so it is the true light depend on that who would have supposed when looking at the two vessels that those on board the little half-crippled schooner could for a moment have contemplated with confidence a conflict with the well-founded powerful brigantine but there was just this difference the midshipmen felt that they were to the very best of their means performing their duty and they felt a perfect confidence in heaven's protecting power while they knew that the slaver was engaged in the most nefarious of callings and that the most abandoned miscreants composed her crew on she came as though triumphing in her strength hitherto the little wind blowing had been to the northward and east as adair was looking out to the northward he observed a dark blue line coming rapidly along over the water he pointed it out to murray trim sails was the order promptly given in another minute the little schooner close hauled with her sails like boards was standing away to the westward while the brigantine lay dead to the leeward at the distance of at least two miles and a half some minutes passed even before she felt the breeze and when she did it it was pretty evident that it would take her many a weary hour to catch up the schooner the midshipmen agreed that with the opportunity thus afforded them of getting away from the slaver it would be the height of rashness to wait and encounter her they felt grateful for having been thus preserved and when the brigantine was seen to fill and keep away on her course they could not help joining their men in giving vent to their feelings in a shout of joy they stood on all night eagerly the next morning they looked out not a sign of the brigantine was to be seen for several days after this they were knocking about making often very little way and sometimes drifting back again during a calm double the distance they had made good during the last breeze i do hope sir as how this voyage won't last much longer observed needham to adair pointing to the numberless rents and torn places in the sails i don't think this here canvas would stand another stiffish gale without flying into ribbons i've been hunting about and i've found a spare boat sail and some other stuff to mend them to my mind it's the best thing we could do before another squall catches us needham's advice was immediately taken and the wind being very light the sails were lowered and all hands set to work to mend them in the best fashion they could needham having once belonged to the sailmaker's crew was a very fair hand at the work but the rest were anything but expert however all used their needles to the best of their abilities adair pricked his fingers very often and as he observed he left indisputable traces of his industry so important was it to get their sails set again before night that they scarcely allowed themselves time for their meals having done little else than drift about all day it was with no little relief to their minds that just as the sun went down they once more got the sails bent and hoisted murray's sextant had been broken and as he was leaving the archer a shipmate offered him his quadrant it was a very indifferent one at best and in one of the gales to which the venus had been subject it had received yet further damage so that it was often ten or even twenty miles out of adjustment murray and adair never lost an opportunity of taking an observation while they kept their reckoning with the greatest care but after all they often could only guess at their position the weather too was very uncertain day after day came torrents of rain 
not merely english spring showers but as adair observed regular buckets full which compelled them to open the ports to let the water run off the decks for fear of swamping the vessel no people could behave better than did their little crew murray allowed no one to be idle they were employed either in cleaning their arms mending their clothes repairing the rigging and when the sea was sufficiently calm in fishing needham kept up his own spirits as did his best to keep up that of his messmates however there were to be again severely tired one evening early in october scud was seen flying rapidly across the sky while thick masses of cloud banked up densely in the horizon it was adair's first watch murray had been about to turn in he cast his eyes around depend on it adair we are going to have a heavy blow a regular tornado will be down on us before long and the sooner we make everything snug the better adair doubted whether there would be anything more than a squall just then the sails flapped ominously and there was a perfect calm the flame of a candle brought on deck would have ascended straight upwards adair i tell you it will be down on us in a few minutes and with terrific force too exclaimed murray all hands shorten sail not a moment was to be lost needham and the rest saw that with the exception of the forestay sail every sail was lowered and carefully stowed the topmasts were struck and everything on deck was lashed and secured all the time a dead calm continued the atmosphere was dreadfully close so that even on deck at times it seemed difficult to breathe while all around became darker and darker suddenly a sound like heavy thunder was heard in the distance it is the beginning of the strife the first gun fired in action look there what do you say to that he pointed to a bank of foam which was seen rolling up through the dense gloom towards the devoted little vessel why i suspect that we shall find ourselves in the midst of a sea which will pretty nearly swamp us answered adair on it came rolling and leaping as if eager to destroy the little craft no sooner did her head feel the force of the gale than off like a seabird on the wing she flew before it the forced stay sail was now stowed for from the fury of the tornado it would either have been torn out of the bolt rope or run the vessel under water on flew the little craft the sea every instant getting up and the wind freshening hold on all of you hold on for your lives sang out murray with startling energy the caution was not ill-timed on came a monster sea roaring astern high above her quarters it rose and down it rushed on her decks well nigh swamping her all the hatches had before been secured but had not the ports been open so as to allow the water immediately to run out it would have swamped her the half-drowned crew shook themselves as they once more emerged from the weight of the water above them happily none were washed away End of chapter 18